die on Baltimore. I'm John Carrington, and today is my special opportunity to talk to a fellow Mergenthaler High School graduate. Yes, sir. Um, Brandon Scott majored in computer science. I majored in electrical work, and, I, and he needed me to turn the computer on, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but we're here on Eye on Baltimore, and we're going to talk to him about some of the things that are going on uh, in Baltimore, and of course with the mayor's race. So I'll, everybody, don't go anywhere. This is John Carrington, and this is Eye on Baltimore. So welcome aboard USS Constellation, and enjoy your visit to the historic sites of the Chesapeake Bay Gateways Network. Welcome back to Eye on Baltimore. My special guest today is uh, Brandon Scott, president of the Baltimore City Council. Who was in Baltimore City when I was a student. And we have this decision, uh, the current commission facing the state and the city. It's the most important policy decision facing us in a generation. Because it's not just about the money, which is critically important. Mm -hmm. We know that city schools have been underfunded by the state by $300 million a year for the last 10 years, right? That's unacceptable in the wealthiest state and the wealthiest country in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. But also it's about reforming our education, making sure that the education that the young people receive is leading them to a career today. Much like the one you and I got at Mervo. Hey, right. Making sure that the CTE education matches what's there today. Mm -hmm. And also it's about for mayor mm -hmm. owning education. Right. I was in seventh grade when the school system switched and was given away to the state, right? And since that point, the mayor has never truly owned education. The school system, because it's not technically a city agency, has been looked at as its own thing. Mm -hmm. They might not be a city mm -hmm. agency. They might not directly report to the mayor. But those children are residents of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Those buildings are owned by the mayor and city council. Mm -hmm. And the communities that they're in are Baltimore city communities. This is about building Baltimore community communities and families to be better, and we know the city has to do more, starting with spending more of the city's budget on education. All right, and then of course after they go to school, they have free time on their hands. That's recreation. Uh, what can we do to improve the uh, fun opportunities, the fun educational opportunities for our young people? Yeah, we have to expand that. Listen, I'm a Rec and Parks kid. I started going to rec centers when I was like five years old at Tawanda Rec and Park Heights and J.D. Gross Rec and Park Heights and C.C. Jackson Rec and Park Heights. Uh, that's why I'm here. Those opportunities. I ran track at Mervo, right? Uh -huh. But the first time I wore blue and gold was at Tawanda Rec Center running for the Blazers track club. Mm -hmm. So I've never changed my car. All right. Today. But we know that we have to offer more. Uh, the thing that I'm most proud of as council president, in my short time as council president, when the mayor was presenting his budget to us last summer, I said, we are not moving this budget until you guys agree to open rec centers back up on Saturdays. Something that had not happened in Baltimore since the 70s. Meaning, when I was born, rec centers in 1984 were never open on the weekends. That's unacceptable. But it's also doing the tough work of what we've been doing with the schools, too. Mm -hmm. Renovating, building new, expanding, mm -hmm. making sure that we have a 21st century recreation and parks department, using our parks and other places as outdoor recreation mm -hmm. centers, building up partnerships and programming. We have a great plan from the recreation and parks department, okay. Rec 2025. We will own that, push that, and make sure that we have the best recreation and parks department across the country. My goodness. And of course, our young people are, are out there looking at us saying, what's the future like? It's not being a professional squeegee kid and standing on a corner. No, the future is in the skills that you pick up. And I took electrical construction at Burbo, and you took computer programming. computer programming. And these are skills that can last a lifetime, provide for you, and also put you in a position to provide jobs for other people. How will education and recreation impact crime and grime? Yeah, listen, it's all connected, right? Uh -huh. We have to understand that while we know that we have to have a functioning police department that's constitutional, that's not violating people's rights, that are focused on every day, in my administration, what the police will be focused on is removing violent repeat offenders, people who shoot, kill, and rob people from neighborhoods, focusing in on the flow of illegal guns into Baltimore City. We will do that, and we will do that every day with a vengeance. Mm -hmm. But... We cannot make the mistakes that the mayors in the past have made. We cannot ignore the fact that we have to also build better communities and better people, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you invest in people's education and they're able to get a job right after high school, right? Because, listen, 
Mervo is the most applied to high school in the city. Not city, not poly, not western. Because what are the young people telling us? They want to work and provide for them and their families. What we are going to do to impact that at every level is first and foremost, make those connections. When you and I graduated from Mervo, we could go off to some company because there was some partnership for us to work immediately. We're going to rebuild those for every school. There has to be a pathway for every young person, mm -hmm. knowing even open a city up to those pathways. For example, you know that we have people that do plumbing, HVAC, bricklaying, masonry, all of that stuff. In the Department of Public Works in the city of Baltimore. In the city of Baltimore. We have 45% of those employees that do that kind of work for DPW can retire today. That's right. Who That's right. better to replace them with, with the young people from Baltimore? Baltimore. We also would do tough work like this. We know that some of our neighborhoods, Sandtown, Winchester, for example, has the highest percentage of people in prison, right? We have an Office of Employment Development in the city. Wouldn't it be wise for us to actually use that office to not wait until they return home from prison, mm -hmm. but to go into the prison, working with our trades, working with people, to make sure that when they come home, they can participate in a job that's out here today. Because when I look in Baltimore, I see a lot of cranes. I see a lot of opportunity. There's also other great opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. We've been pushing things about pushing the city to zero waste and changing the way we do trash mm -hmm. and incinerator. That can create thousands of green jobs. Right. Dealing with how we recycle, dealing with how we re reuse our trash, dealing with how we do our energy. That's another industry. Also, when you look at the amount of vacant properties that the city has, what cities like Philadelphia have done with their Philly land care model is then help create small businesses in those neighborhoods, other people from those communities to maintain those green spaces and those properties, helping people grow, but then helping those who need the jobs mm -hmm. the, the most, obtain them in a reasonable way. Mm -hmm. Everything that we do, even dealing with the trauma in the city, mm -hmm. will impact crime and grind because we will have an efficient city government, but doing this also focus on providing opportunity for everyone no matter as it goes. All right, well, we need some advice for parents. This is a new era. We have all sorts of things going on. What advice do you have for Baltimore City parents? First of all, uh, stay involved and stay vigilant, right? What these young people are facing obstacles that even I didn't face, right? I always say to the young people, I said today, actually, when we were recording this in the school earlier, that social media came out when I was in college. I'm an original Facebooker. Uh, when Facebook came out my junior year of college, you had to be in college to be on, mm -hmm. right? And I can only imagine the scrutiny that their lives are going to be under because literally everything they do is stamped in time. Right, right. And what right, we right. have to have parents do is make sure that we're telling our young people that and monitoring what they're doing on social media because also it's where they get preyed on too. It's where people go to find them. And we know that there's serious things happening with young people and children being becoming up missing. It's also where uh, being a, a, a now former middle school basketball coach, social media is also where a lot of our issues start with young mm -hmm. people. You can see it back and forth, them arguing. And in some unfortunate instances, that ends up in somebody being seriously hurt or worse in Baltimore, right? We need to have a, a group of parents that understand that and we will all monitor that together but then also ask for help mm -hmm. when you know something's going on with a young person and you can't get through them sign that young man or young woman up to get a mentor reach out to the city reach out to all these organizations so that we can start to show the level of care for these young people that they deserve because what I tell people and the young people that I mentor the ones that I coach the ones some of the ones that no one else wanted what they wanted more than anything else was structure and accountability. They want to be loved and to be cared for. We just have to provide that for them. And we all as a city have to do that. We have to stop looking at them as something to push away or to call the police on, but something to embrace and to help grow and blossom and to be in their best selves. Oh, I'm so proud of you, man. Murdo graduate, ran track and field. I wrestled, played football. I ran track, too. Um, I played um, uh, baseball for about oh, two weeks. I, I played left out. <laughs> but I earned that position. <laughs> and of course you have to have skills and of course the, the young people here 
uh, need some advice and guidance. You and I took advantage of our opportunity to get an education. What do you say to our young people who are watching? I say to our young people that they are the smartest generation, the most capable generation, and have the biggest potential of any generation we've ever had. They can do things at a young age that we couldn't even imagine, right? But what they have to do is own it, understand the legacy of where they come from, stand on our shoulders to be, as a young student said today, she wants, she wants to be like me when she grows up. I said, no, I need you to be better than me because I'm me so that you don't have to struggle the way that I did. I want you to stand on my shoulders to be something that I could never be. That's what I want them to realize, that the future is literally in their hands. Mm -hmm. The power is in their hands, not just when they become adults, but right now, because when you look at the history of the world, especially this country, from the civil rights movement on down to the gun movement now, anti-gun violence movement now, young people have been the driving force once they recognize their true potential and their true purpose. Oh, man, I think you, you've, you've done so much to inspire our citizens, it inspired me. Uh, when I come back, I'm going to ask you some questions about teamwork, partnerships, because uh, that's going to be a part of making everything happen. Okay, folks, we are here in downtown Baltimore, and we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with more of I on Baltimore. So come aboard USS Constellation, and while you're here in Baltimore, be sure to visit these other attractions of the Chesapeake Bay Gateways Network. Hey, welcome back to I on Baltimore, my special guest. Today is uh, Brandon Scott, president of the Baltimore City Council. Brandon, what's going on with the City Council? You know, we have something called teamwork at Mervo, where teams work together, coaches, players. But in Baltimore City, we have the state's attorney's office, we have the police commissioner, and we have the City Council. Uh, what's going on with the City Council right now? Well, well, City Council is actually working as a team in a way that they never have before. Uh, since I became president in May, we've been very focused on not being uh, just what the president wants, not just what the council wants, but actual deep change for the citizens of Baltimore. And we know all the stuff that happened prior to me becoming president with Healthy Holly and former Mayor Pew and all those things. And what we've been focused on is actually closing those loopholes and making sure that people that are being public service have to have the highest ethical standard in removing that ability and opportunity for them to be corrupt. So, uh, since my short time of becoming president in May, we've closed the Healthy Holly loophole. Shane, who had to file for uh, ethics filings in Baltimore City, as we have another horn, we are in downtown Baltimore. Yeah, we're downtown Baltimore. Baltimore. That's what they're very live and active today. Uh, Change who had to file the ethics forms in Baltimore City. We've also voted to move the Board of Ethics from underneath the Department of Legislative Reference to be under the Inspector General. And I have a piece of legislation pending right now that would change the way elected officials and, and staff members have to deal with reporting gifts. We are trying to build a better Baltimore City government for the future. We also have created a separate equity and structure committee because we know the history of Baltimore being one of the most racial and equitable cities in the country, the birthplace of housing redlining legislation, and we know we're going to start to undo that via my equity assessment program that will now force the city to do everything it does through a lens of racial, gender, and economic equity. But also it's about the structure of city government. Uh, city government structure has not changed much since you graduated from Herbert. That's right, that's right. 1968, folks. The world has changed a lot since 1968 or 74 in this case. And we know that the city needs to do the same thing. So we're discussing a lot of charter amendments that the voters will have to discuss and vote on in November. We have been able to have the community go out on a road show, mm -hmm. changing the structure of city government, making it more balanced, making it more open to the citizens. For example, we know that uh, the Board of Estimates is the, where most of the city contracts go through. Right now, as the president of the council, I'm the chair of the board. The board pushes through $500 million of contracts a year. Now, what if I were to tell you that I'm the president of the board, chair of the board, the president of the city council, it's also the mayor on the board, and the comptroller. That would be great. But the way that this outdated system is, is that they add the Department of Public Work Director and the city solicitor, two mayoral appointees to be on the board, who are never going to vote against what the mayor wants. Wow. So, for example, if this last year, there was no way that then President Young and Comptroller Pratt could have stopped those contracts that are going through and related to book deals because they would have been outvoted. 
we're going to reduce the border estimates to just the three elected officials so the citizens can directly hold people accountable. And then uh, just recently, we also know that we have this coronavirus thing that's, that's spreading. We had a good hearing with the health department about how the city is prepared to step up and step in and do what they have to do to keep our citizens safe and healthy and educated throughout this process. And lastly, I will say we know the city, unfortunately, uh, the administration, the Department of Public Works has struggled for quite a long time to deal with water bills in Baltimore. We had an investigative hearing in the council this week to see why haven't they been billing people, what's going on, how they're going to make sure that people in the city are getting correct bills, but also in Baltimore County. And we will continue to do tough work like that. And we also passed a piece of important legislation that I introduced recently that asked the people who gun traffic or straw purchase weapons into Baltimore City or transfer them to young people in Baltimore City to our gun defender registry so that we're holding them accountable as well. Wow. Then there are the unions, the Fraternal Order of Police. Shouldn't there be some partnership with the mayor and the president of the city council with some of these unions, especially the FOP? Yeah, I listen, as a former union member myself, uh -huh. working at uh, UFCW Local 27 when I worked at the Giant in Park Heights on mm -hmm. Rice's Town Road and being a son of a union worker who still works there mm -hmm. and a grandson of a former UAW worker who worked at the General Motors plant here. Union jobs and opportunity created the opportunity for me to be here. I'm always going to work well with our friends from labor. I'm blessed to have the support of them in my campaign for so many of them. But it's also about accountability. Yes, you're right. There should be a relationship between FOP, the mayor, the police commissioner, etc. And now three times in my term as council president, I've offered up my office as a place for the police commissioner and the FOP president to come and try to mediate their issues. And that's the kind of leadership I will continue Beautiful. to exude. Beautiful. All right, and, and again, give us <clears throat> the message why you should be raised up a level in your leadership for Baltimore City. This is not about Brandon Scott. This is about Baltimore. This is the most important election in Baltimore's history. Because it's not about just who the next mayor will be. It's about what kind of mayor they will be, what they will stand for, and what they're willing to do to improve Baltimore. Will we have a mayor that's tied to the hip of a status quo that got us to this point that we're in, in today? Or will we elect a leader of a new generation that can bring transformation and generational change leadership to Baltimore that will be willing to build a better city government for everyone, making it professional, making it equitable, making it accountable and transparent, but also someone that's willing to do something that elected officials have been afraid to do for far too long. We need a mayor who's unafraid to be unelected because they did the right thing over the popular one, and that's me. That's the kind of leadership I want to exude. That's a new way forward for Baltimore, and that's why I should be elevated to be the next mayor of Baltimore City. I'm John Carrington, a Mergenthaler Mustang, next to my fellow Mergenthaler Mustang, president of the Baltimore City Council, Brandon Scott. Sir, do you have any final thoughts for us? I just want to say thank you for the opportunity and to remind everyone that Baltimore is not down. We are not out. Uh, remember, Brian, and people that you have to believe in Baltimore. We never give up. Never. We always come back stronger and better than ever. You can look throughout the history of our city. That's what we do. So if you are feeling down about Baltimore, come back. Call people. Invest. Spend time with our young people. Spend time in a community. Spend time helping someone. Invest your time and energy in Baltimore now. You will not regret it. All right. Well, this is I on Baltimore. I want to thank my special guest, President of Baltimore City Council, Brandon Scott. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I want everybody to remember, keep your eye on Baltimore and uh, be involved. Be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. I'm John Carrington. This is I on Baltimore. Thank you, Brandon Scott. Thank you. And everybody, see you next time on I on Baltimore. Yay!